I'd like to welcome everybody to our Sunday school hour also. Like Brother Thomas said, I appreciate you coming out and being with us this morning. We're going to ask Brother Arnold, if he would, to ask the blessings on the Sunday school offering. What a great looking congregation this morning. I know um, you're missing Brother Jay today. He's uh, over to help his family a little bit with some singing and uh, probably some teaching as well. So he asked me if I'd fill in and look forward to the opportunity always to do something for the Lord. And uh, been studying this week and trying to come up with something. And I, I ran across a few scriptures. I know of one thing that God's Word will help us. I've learned that from a long time ago. If we just read, study God's Word, I love to get work, God's Word in us, and there's going to come a time when that Word really helps us a lot. And uh, so if we can just uh, take the next few minutes and kind of learn God's Word a little bit and see what God happens, we can find some uh, life applications, things that will help us as we go through our daily journey. Um, do you desire your prayers today? Uh, this is a, uh, thank God will bless it, like I said. Um, we're going to start out, I was looking at God's word, and, you know, I, I realize and I look at people, even last night we had a, a, a young child get burnt really, really severely, and is in need of prayer, and you, you kind of think through things, you know, this innocent little child just playing and just having a good time and falling into a fire. You know, why do things like this happen? And you begin to try to study God's word and try to understand why those things happen. And today we're going to look at several ex examples of when things like that happen and try to discern why it happened. And uh, I think it'll help us in the long run. And I look back in chapter uh, Romans. Romans is a good book. It goes to the church. And um, Romans 5 and 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the thing that I want to point out there is we can obtain that peace through God, through Jesus Christ, or, you know, through, um, through, with God, through Jesus Christ. And I'm going to skip down to verse number three, and it says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Now that, when I read that the first time and I was trying to understand what God's word was telling me, nobody wants to glory in tribulations. You're going through a trial and a tribulation and a tough time and a difficult hour, the, the, the farthest thing from your mind is to be joying in it. You can't glory in those kind of things. But here's the reason for it. The Apostle Paul tells us that knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So if you're going through a tribulation time and a difficult hour in your life, no matter how bad it is, you're learning some patience. You can't, you can't rush through it. It's like, uh, I just want to get through this bad time and get to the other side of the hill. And, um, but you've got to go through it. And that's what he says here. And by doing that, you're learning some patience. And then in verse number four, he says, and patience brings experience. You get that experience. So then you've got experience under your belt. It says, and then experience begins to bring hope and builds hope in your life. And then five, verse five says, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad to our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So, um... So we find that, that we, when we go through these things, it makes us stronger, makes us able to help others. I remember uh, um, a preacher one time telling me that he, he and his wife, Preacher Todd Smith, actually said they lost their baby, their first baby, and he just couldn't understand why. And he went through a very difficult hour. He kept asking God why, and he said the first time he was called to pastor a church within 
a few days or weeks, a young couple there had lost her child. He says, I can relate to you. I can help you through this. And he was able to stand there by them because of the experience that he had had, the tribulations that he had gone through. He was able to help them get through the same process. And that's kind of what the Apostle Paul, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is telling us. So what I want us to do today is I want to look at a gentleman in our Bible back in uh, um, Genesis chapter 35. Actually, 34 is where I'm going to begin today. But his, his name is Jacob at this time. And we see a lot of things where he seems to go through a lot of tribulation. And, um, and his life is a cycle. It's up and down. Just like the whole children of Israel was up and down. They had some great times where they were on the mountain. They, were, they had some times when they were in the valley. And um, I, I remember back in Genesis chapter 32, verse 7, and I didn't ask you to bring that one up, brother, but I just remember back. He says, Jacob was greatly afraid and dis distressed. So he was greatly afraid and distressed. What made him so greatly afraid and distressed? Well, he had sent word to his brother that he had, hadn't seen in probably about 20 years and uh, said, hey, I'm coming home. I want to see you. And God's blessed me with a bunch of stuff. I don't need your stuff. And uh, so the, the, the messenger came back and said, your brother got the word. He said he's coming to meet you. And he's also bringing 400 men with him. So... The next thing says Esau, or Jacob, was greatly afraid because the last time he saw his brother, his brother was going to kill him for stealing his birthright. And it says that he was also dis very distressed. I can understand that. And so now we, we fast forward. He got through that. He made peace with his brother. Everything was great. So um, we, won't ha we don't have time to go through that scenario of what took place there. But then we jump over to verse chapter 34, verse 30. And it says, And Jacob said unto Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, being few, I and I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And when I read that, and I saw a couple of other places in the Bible when uh, Jacob was talking, I've done a lot of studying on Jacob this week, there was a lot of eyes and me's and my's going on with Jacob. He really was self-centered, if you will. Even when he was talking to God and said, God, you're going to bless me with all this. If you're going to give me a house, you're going to give me clothes, I'll serve you. You know, you're going to do this all for me, I'll, I'll serve you. You're going to protect me from my enemies, I'll serve you. That was his prayer, if you go back and read it. And then when you read this one here, Levi and Simeon had done something uh, very uh, rough, if you will. Um, and what, what basically they did was they had moved into this new area and bought some land. It was in Canaan's land. They bought some land from a fellow there. And um, put it in today's world, they had one sister. Remember, they had, um, at this time, they had uh, 12 kids if you will, 11 boys and one girl. Leah had one daughter, Dinah, and Dinah was, went out with the girls and, uh, you know, looking at the town and stuff like that, and she got in a place where she probably shouldn't have been, maybe, but it doesn't matter. You never justify rape, and that's basically what took place. Uh, a gentleman there raped her, and he says, hey, I love this girl. I want her, and, and um, Levi and Simeon were her true, full brothers. You remember we had four wives there, and... Um, so these were the full brothers, and that was their sister that got raped. And they, they just uh, went ballistic about it, and they said, we'll get even with this. So they uh, went in and slaughtered the entire village of all the men. They took the women, they took their animals, and they just took over. And so Levi, or Jacob, sitting here saying, you, you, you've made me a disgust. He said, you, you make me a stench among all the inhabitants. And he says, now they're going to come and kill us. It really says me, me. You're going to kill me. You're going to kill my family. You're going to kill all the stuff we've got because they're going to hate us. So he is in so, really, really distressed after going through the time where Esau was going to kill him. Then he made peace. He was on the mountain again. Now he's back in the valley again because he's moved into a new area. And they're going to kill him. So what does he do? We jump over. Um, he does what we should do. I know we, we, we sometimes, we use God as a spare tire, and we should not. You know, when we get in trouble, that's when we call on God. And that's not the way to do it. We should have God with us all the time and in our hearts so that when we go through these trials and tribulations, they can work the hope that comes at the end of it is what, the, uh, uh, what Paul, the Apostle Paul, was teaching us. So we start in verse number one, 
of chapter 35. And that's where I want to start it at today. And um, <clears throat> it says, And God said unto Jacob, Arise and go into Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God that appeareth unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. So we find out in chapter 2, chapter 32 I mean, that's when he fled from his brother. So it's been uh, three chapters ago when he fled and he wrestled with God or he had a, actually had a dream in this place and he named the place Bethel. And he dreamed of the ladder and all the things and God said he was going to be with him and bless him and take care of him. And so what we find there is now... God's come to him, you're in distress, things are in bad shape. He obviously turned to God and God said, get out of this land, get out of Canaan's land and go back to Bethel. So we're going to find Jacob going back to Bethel today and see if that helps. You know, do we turn to God in times of trouble? Bethel was a place that said the house of God is the name of Bethel. That's what the interpretation of the word is. And he says in verse number two, it says, and Jacob said unto his household and to all them that were there with, with him, Put away thy strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. Now, instructions. I think what we're finding out here is Jacob is finally growing up a little bit. If you remember his wife when he was fleeing from Laban, that's another whole story, but you know, she took her father's gods with her and hid them in the camel's sack and said, I can't get up, Dad, right now. And uh, so he didn't find them. But you know, Jacob didn't know she had them because Jacob said, Whoever's got your gods, you kill them. So I don't have your gods. I don't need your gods. I'm going back to my homeland. And if he'd have known Rachel had them, he would not have stated it so emphatically because he would. Rachel, as you know, is the one that he loved. He labored for uh, 14 years for her hand in marriage, if you will. He got her after seven, but still he labored for 14 years just to be married to her because he was tricked. But what we find out here is that he says, put away your strange gods. I'm surprised by... Um, Jacob at this moment that he still allowed those gods. And it's probably because it was Rachel because of his love for his wife. You, sometimes we can love somebody, a, a son, a child, a grandchild, too much to the point where we overlook their faults when they should be getting some correction. Now, thankfully, God, he says, we need the joy in tribulation. So he says he'll chasten those whom he loves. So God doesn't let us by with things like that. But apparently, Jacob allowed... Uh, Rachel to keep her little gods and continue to, and then it propagated throughout all of his people. So he, his first declaration here says, put away those strange gods from among you and be clean. He said, clean yourself up. I think he was more speaking of spiritually clean there because the next one says to change your garments. Now changing your garments, you can put on a new suit today and walk in this church and it won't make a difference on your spiritual well-being unless there's a change in your heart. That's where it really needs to, to start at. But this is what he said to do. He says, let's do this. Let's put these things away. So we see Jacob making an effort to get back to Bethel. And then verse number three, it says, And let us arise and go to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, and who will answer me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. So he remembered back. He says, God answered me in the day of my distress, and he went with me wherever I went. And so God was there with me. And verse number four says, and they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all that were, all their earrings that were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak tree which was in Shechem. So what he did, you know, earrings at that time were a sign of worship. It, it was, uh, things have changed a lot since then, but that was a, a way of worshiping other gods as well. And so they took your earrings and all their gold stuff and the things that they had. He went and buried them. Why he didn't burn them, I don't know. Why he didn't destroy them. I guess burying them and putting them in a place where nobody knew where they were at was, was sufficient. Because from what I understand, they don't go back to them. And then verse number 5, it says, And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So here, they did all this here in verse number 1 through 4, and look what happened in verse number 5. God placed a terror on the inhabitants of the land, to the point they said, don't touch this man. And he, his sons just went in and slaughtered all the men folk, took the women, took their animals, and he was in fear for his life. But God said, don't touch him, leave him alone. So God already begins to put his hands of protection around this man, a wall of protection. And it says in verse number, um, and they says they did not pursue after Jacob, they let him go. And uh, in verse number six it says, and Jacob came to Luz, which is also the name of Bethel, 
which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him, and he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel. El is God, so God, the God of the house, because their God appeared unto him, and he fled from the face of his brother. When he fell, fled from the face of his brother. And then verse number 8 says, And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried beneath Bethel under the oak. And the name of the place was Alambakoth. And God appeared unto Jacob again, and he came out of Panadaram and blessed him. And he said unto him, he's already done this one time in chapter 32, but he says, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called more, any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. So from that point on, he became, Jacob became Israel, if you start looking at the Bible and uh, what God said do. And it says, and then verse number 11 says, And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and the kings shall come out of thy loins. So now we find out that, that God is telling him, hey, I'm going to protect you. He's already demonstrated that. Go be fruitful and multiply. Get all the, the grow in wealth, grow in um, family, you know, begin to grow. And it says, and kings shall come out of thy loins. So he's basically saying some of your descendants are going to be kings, and they are. And they were. They will come. So God's beginning to make this here. And, and not even get sweeter. The deal gets even sweeter. So all Jacob did was turn back to God and would see what kind of blessings begin to come upon him. It says, In the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. So what we find here is that he's already given this land to Abraham. He's given it to Isaac. And now this is some valuable, special land. He's given it to uh, Jacob or Israel at this point so that he will have this same land and so he's making that same agreement with him he's got his protection upon him he's going to bless him with kings in his uh, inheritance and they're going to uh, give him the land a place to stay it says and God went up from that place and where they talked and Jacob set a pillar and verse 14 basically talks about the first drink offering in the Bible so he offers a drink offering and so at this time if, you, if Jacob's anything like us, and he obviously is, I see a lot of I's and me's and my's in there as I study him, and that's a lot of the way we are. At this moment, he's kind of walking around like, oh yeah, God's got the blessings on me. Things are going good, perfect. You know, hey, I, I've been touched. God's taking care of my problem. I was in such distress that people were going to kill me. That's behind me. I don't have any problems anymore. Let me just go and live life and enjoy time. But life's a cycle. We think that we're on top of the mountain today. One phone call this morning can change our whole attitude. And we can be in the valley quickly. It doesn't take long. So that's why I say we need to keep God close to us so we can continue to have that fellowship with him and so we can learn from him. But God's word can help us here. I've got really, I'll, I'll rush through them quickly, but I do want to show Soon as he did this here, and soon he's high on the mountain, he's walking, he's strutting, he is living life to the fullest, and things are working great for Israel at this point, bad things begin to happen. Let's look at the first bad thing. Verse, chapter, verse number 16 out of chapter 35 it says, And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. So Rachel is the love of his life. He's the one that she, he worked for 14 years. You know, he worked for seven years, and his father-in-law tricked him and said, hey, got it, you want to marry her? Um, give, her give her seven days of your honeymoon, and then you can marry her, and then, but you got to work another seven years. So 14 years he had to labor for her. And um, so he loved her a lot. She had given birth to one, or to one child already, which was Joseph. And um, we find here that she's got... The twelfth son being born, I mean the, the eleventh, yeah, the twelfth son being born at this point. And it says, and she had hard labor. So a joyous moment, everybody's excited, things are great, you're getting ready to have a, a child, and you know how it is when you're older like uh, I am, you have a child, you're like, man, this is great, we got a little grandchild coming this month, in a couple of weeks, so it's excitement coming. But what we find out here 
is that, and it came to pass that when she was in hard labor that the midwife said, fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass that her soul was in departing for she died. And she called his name Benoi, and his father called him Benjamin. And that was the, you know, it was the son of my sorrows is what she was naming him. Hey, I'm sorrowed. And he says, no, he's not. He's my right hand. He's going to help me get around. This, you know, I'm proud of this young man, even though it was a sorrowful time. But what we find out here is within moments, he lost his wife of his love, dead. Death came on the scene. Then we jump down to the second bad thing in chapter um, uh, 35, verse 22. It says, and it came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Billah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. So it didn't take long, but now his oldest son of, of Leah, Reuben, goes and sleeps with his wife. Awful stuff, things that should not happen are happening in his life. On the mountaintop just a moment ago, now his favorite wife is dead and his oldest son is committing adultery with his other wife. Awful stuff. So you think things are going good and all of a sudden it turns bad. Look at number three, um, verse 29 of that same chapter. It says, uh, um, well actually, uh, verse number um, 28 says, And the days of Isaac were a hundred and four score, which is 180, long life. It says, And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered into the people, being old and full of days, and the son of Esau and Jacob buried him. So we find out real quickly, now his dad's died. The dad that he loved, 180 years, the patriarch of the family. Now he's going to have to step it up and become more of a man than he ever was before. So now three things, three awful things have taken place in just a moment of time. Then we jump over to verse, chapter 37 and verse number 3. It says, Now Israel loved Jacob more than all his children. I'll stop there because you know about the coat of many colors and how he... Uh, pampered his uh, son because she was the son of Rachel, the wife he loved, and all that thing was so sweet. But he messed up. You don't t you don't treat one kid better than another when you got multiple kids. That's just not the way to do it. And he he repeatedly did this, even with his grandchildren. <clears throat> he continued to do this and live this way. But we find out that he loved them, which made the other kids despise him. And then we find out in verse um, thirty one of that same chapter thirty seven. He says, and they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. So what we find there, it's kind of ironic to me when I was reading this. I'm like, <clears throat> a kid, when's a kid been killed? A kid being a goat. And uh, deception came about. Well, if you remember when he took and stole his brother's birthright, his brother's blessing, he put the kid's hair on his hand to try to pretend to be hairy and made the goat and uh, said, oh, this is venison here. So he was deceiving. And now he's being deceived by his children with the kid of a goat. Kind of ironic to me when we read that. But it says that he dipped the coat in the blood and then they, um, they set the coat of many colors and, and brought it to their father and said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And in verse 33 it says, and he knew it and he said, it's my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured it, and Joseph is, no doubt, is without doubt rent in pieces. So he begins to imagine what took place to his son, looking at the coat, looking at the blood that's all over it, and seeing it just shredded. He said a beast is no doubt shredded him alive and just eat him alive, and he is gone. His son's dead. So now the, the, the four things taking place this quickly and in verse 35, he says, I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. So he said, I'll mourn the rest of my life until I die because my son's dead. So we find now the fourth thing that just all of a sudden life changed that quick on him. Number five, we look down to verse number or chapter 42, verse 36. <laughs> Or, and Jacob, yeah, I'm on the wrong chapter, wrong chapter. 
And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have you bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, Simeon is not, and you will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. So he began to, the fifth thing that takes place is now, uh, as we fast forward through time, and the famine is hit, Joseph is in Egypt, and there's food there, and Joseph has got uh, Benjamin put in a, uh, or, or not yet, but he's got Simeon locked up, and they're coming back saying, we need more, uh, we need more food, Dad, we're going to starve to death, we've got to go back to Egypt and get more food, or we're not going to make it through this famine. And he says, no, he says, I've already lost Joseph, you're not taking Benjamin, and Simeon's locked up, I, I, it's not happening, you're not going there. So he begins to struggle and agonize with this, but sure enough, when people get hungry, things get different. And he got hungry, and the family began, and all the people that he was responsible for began to get hungry. And then um, we find over there in uh, 43.11, it says, um, or let's go 43.13. Take also your brother and arise and go again unto the man. He says, so, and he, and he says, if I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So he says, if they die, if I'm bereaved, they're just gone. I'm, you know, I, I, we got to eat. We got to have something. So now the, the fifth thing in his life where he was on the mountaintop and boom, 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 boom. It seemed like everything's getting worse and worse. Now he's getting ready to lose his other favorite son. He says, if, if I lose him, I lose him. It's, it's, just, it's just awful. And, um, but he said, hey, take, take double your money. Take some good honey. Take some uh, almonds and, and things and try to butter him up a little bit. And, and let's go back to the man and, and try to be nice to him and see if we can't you know, make sure my son gets released and, and you bring Benjamin back to me. He says, but if not, it is what it is. He said, um, and then he, he, he goes down and he says, um, I'll just skip that part. Bad number six, the sixth thing that took place was uh, verse chapter 45, verse 20. I'm not sure if I gave that one to you, brother, back there, but it says, regard not your stuff. So basically, Israel had to leave everything he had, all the wealth that he had amassed, all the things that he had, and he had to leave it all behind because he was going to, he was going to have to go to Egypt in order to live and survive. So he lost everything. Just imagine just for a moment, you know, your children are dying, you're, um, and that's unnatural. It really is. When, when a, It's natural for our kids to bury us and put us in the grave, but when you have to bury a kid, that is the most, to me, it's a gut-wrenching thing to occur. And, and, and I know bad things happen to people all the time, and, and you're trying to figure out why. Why, God? Why is all this here happening at this point? But a lot of times it's a matter of how we look at things. You know, sometimes we look at things through... Uh, the wrong set of glasses on. We're seeing things through our human eyes and we're seeing things going bad. Um, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is uh, Philippians 4 through 9, 4, 7 through 9. It says, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So you want to keep your minds through Christ Jesus. <coughs> Apostle Paul tells us how to do it. He said, finally, brothers, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, he says, um, <clears throat> whatsoever things be of a, are lovely and whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. He says, and if you do that, and says, whatsoever things you have learned, or whatsoever things you have received, whatsoever things you have heard, whatsoever things you've seen me do, you do it. That's what the Apostle Paul was saying. And he says, and if you do that, the God of peace shall be with you. So that's what we need to do, and that's how we need to look at things. A lot of times we go through tough times, and you, know, I've, you can get depressed, you can get discouraged, you can get down in the dumps, but if you begin to do what he says here, begin to think on things that are true. The Word of God's true. Begin to think about things that are pure. You know, there's some lot of ugly stuff, like uh, what Reuben did was ugly. But there's a lot of good stuff out there that we can think on. And you begin to think on those things. It says, if there be any praise, if there be any virtue, begin to praise the Lord. And all of a sudden, you will be amazed that your whole demeanor and outlook on life kind of flourishes. It kind of grows up a little bit. It kind of 
it kind of gets better, and it does. If we'll just think on the good things, because I know if I just sit here and think about how bad the world is or how bad something's going or how, you know, somebody's sick, someone passed away, um, somebody's in the hospital, if all I do is dwell on the really bad stuff, it won't be long before I'm walking around with my shoulders kind of down. But if I begin to think of the good things, I got a birth, you know, I got a grandbaby going to be born in a couple of weeks. You know, hey, there's some excitement going on. And um, uh, those kind of things, you can, you can begin to see your whole demeanor just kind of lift right up. And that's what he was trying to tell us. So if I go back and look at each one of those here times, number one, Rachel died. The good that came out of that was Benjamin was born. There was a baby that was born and he took care of him and things were good. And also where she died, it was a bad time to die. But they buried her in a place, in a grave right there near, near Bethlehem. And people go there. I pulled it up on the internet this week and looked at it. Thousands of photos of her grave inside of a dome. And you look around, it looks like there's nothing else around. But millions of people have gone to Rachel's grave just to see where she stays. If you go to Israel now, you can go see Rachel's grave in Bethlehem. So not only, you know, she died, but if she'd been died and buried in the woods somewhere where nobody ever heard of her again, Nobody ever hear it, but they still talk about Rachel even to the day. And then um, good number two, hard to find something when Reuben did what he did with his um, stepmom, if you will. I think he was trying to take over. He, I think he was fearful at this moment, if you know what's going on in life here. He was concerned that Joseph's, okay, I got my son back, and y'all boys are getting ready to get in trouble because he's going to tell on you what happened and, and things are going to get rough. So he was trying to challenge him for the, the manhood, the leadership of the, he's the oldest son, so he's going to challenge. He's going to say, hey, you can't kill all of us brothers. We're not going to have it done. And I think that's what part of his uh, issue was, but at the same time, it changed him. He didn't get the birthright because he, when he gives his blessings, his note, you're going to be unstable as water. It's not going to happen. And he gave a double blessing to Joseph and his kids because he had Manasseh and his other son. Good number three, daddy died. Isaac, hey, he lived 180 years. That's pretty good. But one thing it did, Esau and Jacob, or Israel, they came together to bury their dad. They had been apart. So many times we do the same thing. Just so you and your family, we have our family reunions at a graveside. And we shouldn't. We should do it a little bit better than that. But that's what we do. But that's what happened. These brothers, they kind of lived their own separate lives, doing their own things. But when their dad died, the good that came out of it is they came together to bury him with his wife. Number four, his favorite son torn to pieces. Chapter 45, verse number seven says, And God sent me before you to preserve you, a posterity in earth, and to save the lives of the great deliverance. So number four, so we thought it was bad, but Joseph wasn't even dead. He wasn't ripped and torn to pieces. He, and he's finding out now, not only is he alive, but he's like the number head honcho down there in Egypt taking care of people. So what, what father or parent doesn't want their children to succeed above what we succeed? There's, there's not one. We, we all want our kids, our grandkids to excel anything that we can ever come to. He's sitting there looking at his son, Joseph being up there pretty high up in the, in the Egyptian world, if you will, and saving the world. And it says here, um, one thing I think was so great in verse um, 40, or 26 of 45, it says, And he told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is the governor of all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed him not. He didn't believe him. It's like, this man's been dead for years now. There's no way he's alive. And he says, and he and they told him all the words of Joseph, and he said unto them, And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. So we, we find here that he didn't believe it either until he saw the wagons come. He saw all this here stuff coming to take him to the home. And he said, Okay. He is alive, so I am going to go there. So the good that came out of number four where he thought his son was dead, he wasn't dead, but he had assailed and, assailed and been very blessed, if you will. Number five, um, his other son, Benjamin, 
We thought he was dying, thought he was dead. But no, what took place with Benjamin was Joseph was putting a hand of protection. He was more protected in the jail of Egypt, Egypt than he was with his other brothers. And that's the way Joseph looked at it because he knew how their brothers were. He didn't know if they had grown up any. They still willing to kill anybody, do anything to get what they want. And so he had to trust them. He had to, he had to test them, if you will. And uh, he was protecting his brothers. That's why Benjamin, so the bad that we thought was bad, that, that Jacob thought was bad, putting him in a jail, not, you know, making, taking him from me, uh, it wasn't bad at all. It was good. So the bad, so when we put on a different set of glasses, we look through uh, something through a spiritual set of eyes, we see things are a little bit better than what we um, thought originally. And then the bad, um, the, you know, suffering the home and said, hey, leave all your stuff. Don't worry about your stuff in Egypt. Guess what? He says, we got more than enough stuff here over in Egypt. Take care of you. And Joseph, you remember in the scripture, he said, listen, when you leave this place, take my bones with you. I don't want to be here. He says, I know that this here, God's going to make a great nation out of us, out of our family. And we are going to leave Egypt. And when we go, take my bones with you. Because I want to leave Egypt. I don't want to be left here. So all those things took place. So those five, there's six things that we thought were really horrible, and they were. They were pretty bad. They turn out to be a little bit better and not as bad as we think. And then, um, so I'm trying to figure out, you know, I want to go over to John chapter 9, brother, verse number 2. And we're going to wrap this thing up and kind of learn some lessons. We saw, if we recap a little bit, we said, we're looking at... Jacob changed to Israel. He was in the dumps several times. He was on the mountaintop several times, and then he was beat down, beat down, beat down with a bunch of stuff. And then finally at the end, he's sitting in Egypt. When he dies, he's able to see all of his kids, his grandkids. He's able to give them blessings upon blessings. And he was probably living in the lack of luxury in Egypt more so than he would have been if he was still over there where he was at in in, in the area that he was dwelling in. So things worked out pretty well for him. So, but now, and that, that's because we got the hindsight. We've got the, we've got the uh, ability to look back in time or look at history and say, oh yeah, it's like going through a bad time and you look back and say, hey, God was helping me the whole time. He was preparing me for something that was going to come. So when we look at these things, <clears throat> you know, we see good people struggle all the time. I remember um, when I was working, I had a, a young man, he was there, very successful, and had a six-year-old boy, and he got cancer, he beat it, he came out of it, and things were looking good, and on a Friday, he went to Duke, just for um, a little checkup or something, he never came home, he died of cancer, and he was teaching his son how to catch snakes, which I wouldn't do, he was doing all kind of stuff, he was a good family man, I'm like, God, why, you know, now a widow's got to raise a six-year-old by herself, I just couldn't understand that, and I may never understand it, but I can, you know, because I don't, I'm, I, I weren't able to put on the right set of glasses to see it through God's eyes. But we find out here, why do bad things happen to, the, to, to our good people? And um, we find something, we can find some insight out of the book of John, chapter 9, verse number 2. It says, and his disciples asked him, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So sometimes when we see something going really, really bad, things are bad and awful, sometimes it's for God to get some glory. So what, that's what Jesus said. Jesus knew, and Jesus is a right judge. He knows what the answer is, and he gave them the answer. We look over in Revelation. So sometimes it's for God to get the glory. Revelations 3 and 17 says, Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and need of nothing. Sometimes we get like that, don't we? We think we just, that we got it made. You know, big bank account. We don't have to worry about anything. We don't have to worry about the food going out. It says, I have, I'm rich, increased with goods and need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. God sees us through a different set of glasses, if you will. He knows the truth. We may think that we're high and mighty, but God knows our heart. And then in verse number 19, it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. 
as many as I love, I chasten. And that's what God does. So he says, so the second reason is sometimes we're just a little bit stubborn, hard-headed, and we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing, and God needs to get our attention because he loves us so much that he's going to spank us. Like we said, the kids earlier, there's some kids that need spanking. They need correction if you want to keep them going in the right direction. And sometimes we don't do it. So right here, God says a number two reason. Number one is God gets glory. Number two is we need it. Okay, we need to be corrected. Um, and as long as we've got free will in our lives and God gives us free will, when, when there's an absence of God in a life, there, there is evil. That, that, that's the pure definition of evil is when God's not present in a certain spot. There'll be evil present. But let's look at Luke chapter 13, verse number 1. I will, uh, Jesus Christ himself gives us some more reasons why and what we should do. 13 and 1 says, There were present at the season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. So there were some people there that Pilate took their blood and mingled it with the sacrifices. That's pretty awful there to me. How would any of us want to volunteer for that one or get that done? You know, to be killed and somebody just mingle our blood just to show that I killed them all. It says, And Jesus answering them, said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? So Jesus asked them directly, So do you think that those were the worst sinners in all of Galilee because their blood was mingled with sacrifices. And here's what Jesus said. I tell you, in verse 3, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So he again, just like Revelation 3.17, he says, repent. Here he says, just because these people died, all 18 of them died, or not 18, but these people died and their blood was mingled, his message to them was, don't worry about them, you need to repent or you're going to perish just like they did. And then verse number four, he says, or, this is Jesus talking now, red letter edition, or those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? So there was another incident where a, a, you know, a, something fell killed 18 people. He said, do you think those were the worst sinners? you think God was bringing judgment upon them? You could see an awful wreck down the road and see somebody just mangled and die. We say, oh, they must have got judgment. We don't know that. We have no clue as to what was going on. But what we do know is that except we repent, those that are still around and see these activities, see these bad things, and except we repent, we shall all likewise perish. So what I see here, and um. Again, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's God's message to us. We need to repent. So we see life's a cycle. It's up and down. Good things happen. Bad things happen to good people all the time. We, we can't sit here and say, well, that's the reason right there. He just gave us several reasons so God can get the glory because we need it and we need to repent. And repent's the big thing. We want to make it from earth to glory and that's how we do it. And um, hope you got something out of the lesson today. Uh, uh, any questions or anything that, or comments? No. God bless you.